Contamos con nada menos que Rogerio Silva, Game Design Director de Ubisoft Barcelona, que han sido uno de los creadores de Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Y digo uno de los creadores porque, como suele ocurrir con los juegos de Ubisoft de unos años para esta parte, ha sido un esfuerzo distribuido por todo el mundo. Buenos días, Rogerio. Good morning. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Just a second. Can I hear you now? I think I can. Good morning, can you Rogerio. Can hear me? Yes, now I can. Hey, <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Hope you're doing fine. How's it your life now with the pandemic? Um, it's uh, pretty good, I guess. A bit like everyone else, you know, adjusting, working from home. Mm. I've been doing this from March since March, so uh, we're pretty used to it now. You're still based in Barcelona, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, before we move forward, we have a video to, well, introduce the game to our audience, even though I'm sure that it needs no introduction. It's always a pleasure watching <laughs> something from Assassin's Creed, so let's go with the video. See if I could reach it. Okay, but take it slow. in total. Ten. Okay, I can do ten. Does the Animus give achievements for stuff like this? Sorry, does it what? Forget it. Wow. <laughs> That was something. Congratulations for your work. Uh, the game has been very well received by critics and players, so I guess you. you can call it a victory, right? Yeah, well, it's it really is incredible after two years of working on all of that to finally see it out to the public and um, see everyone enjoying it and uh, also seeing clips of videos and of people playing. It's it's pretty cool. 
Mm-hmm. Ubisoft started uh, this model of distributed work uh, between different studios from all over the world mm, a few years ago. Were you, as a studio, somehow better prepared for what happened this year because of that? Um, uh, that's a that's a fairly good point. I think for um, especially uh, working with our partners, uh, nothing's really changed because we're used to uh, um, working remotely and being online with each other every day. Um, and I guess for for those in the Ubisoft Barcelona studio, it changed a little bit. Um, but thanks to our IT department and the tools they uh, gave us, we were able to adapt very quickly. And yeah, we're we're able to work from home just like if we were in the office, uh, which is pretty cool. Yeah, Assassin's Creed as a franchise went through a brutal change in the gameplay um, proposal a few years ago. Um, how was that, from your point of view as a, as a game designer, how was that process of adapting to that new um, approach to game design? It's a fairly different game than it was five years ago. Uh, yeah, I think, I think as a long, a long uh, franchise uh, that people love, uh, we, we have to adapt uh, and try and offer new experiences to players. Um, so that is part of, part of that process. Really, and when when it came to Valhalla, you know, trying to create the ultimate uh, uh, Viking experience, there is a lot of new stuff that comes with that. Um, at the same time, uh, this game was an opportunity to try and marry uh, a bit of the old with the new, um, bringing back social stealth, uh, the hidden blade, um, but also trying to do things in a in a slightly different way for an Assassin's Creed game uh, for the first time. You mentioned that you wanted to create the ultimate Viking experience, which, by the way, is a great title for a heavy metal album. Um, <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of changes the setting can bring to the gameplay? Because usually in games development, gameplay is the king, of course. So it's mm -hmm. the yeah. game design department who goes to the artists or to the writers and say, hey, I want to do this. Uh, how can we, you know, dress this in a nice setting or whatever. But in some cases, I'm guessing that, especially in the Assassin's Creed franchise, is the other way around. We're doing a Viking game. We need to include this, this, and do that in gameplay to make sense as a Viking experience. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a very rich game. Uh, obviously, there's the ultimate Viking experience is, is like the big, uh, the big uh, pillar of the game, for sure. Um, but uh, it is very much like a, a 12 course meal, <laughs> you know, with so many dishes and, and so many flavors, you know. Um, and for us, it's really receiving the creative direction from Montreal, which is the lead studio, um, and kind of trying to play within that space um, and, and take as many risks as we can. Um, Given that, um, and, and in this game, uh, we're able to, also the way the game is designed is kind of like a big mystery, where every part of the game uh, is giving you a piece uh, to solve that mystery. Um, and in the case of Ubisoft Barcelona, we worked on uh, the Animus Anomalies, which you were able to see in the video earlier. And solving all of those uh, kind of gives you maybe a new ending or a complementary ending that gives you maybe a slightly different perspective. And it's like that across the entire game. You're always finding new pieces that, that put the story in a new light. Um, and that is, uh, that is fairly new to uh, Assassin's Creed, this uh, big uh, puzzle that you're allowed to discover at your own pace. Is that one of the ways that you use to keep people hooked and engaged for 30, 40 hours, because it's very common for gamers not to finish the games they buy. Uh, that's something that yeah. surprises people a lot. So I guess that when you're doing a long game as this one, you have to mm -hmm. take that into account for the game design. Like you have to incrementally give players new mechanics, new features, new stuff to do. So they are, they, they don't grow bored of what they are doing. I mean, it's, it's also, um, I think, more from our perspective is in terms of um, catering 
different types of experiences to different kinds of gamers because you will have the people that are more focused on combat and for that they'll have a lot of stuff they can focus on you know the brutal combat uh, dual wield uh, all the special abilities you get in the game but also for those that are more into exploration um, they can also um, have that experience and go out and discover the animus anomalies um, it's really not a, really about forcing players to do certain things it's more like allowing them the freedom to enjoy the game at their own pace mm -hmm. and you have developed the game this game in particular not just in the middle of a pandemic but also in the middle of a change of generations uh, in consoles that's always a challenge i guess uh, it happened with assassin's creed unity 2 that was uh, released like in the middle of, of this nowhere land between one generation and the next one. How did that affect your, your job and your design plans? I think from the perspective of a partner working with Montreal, it didn't really affect us. Um, but I know the game is, is, uh, has been designed to take advantage as much as possible from, for the next gen consoles with higher frame rate and uh, and higher resolution. Um, but from from our perspective, it, it didn't really change much. We just wanted to make uh, the best content possible. Mm -hmm. From your point of view, not, not just as uh, your job, or from your job as a game design director at Ubisoft Barcelona, but in general, as a game developer, uh, what can a new generation, new technology bring to the table in terms of gameplay? Because we're always thinking of a new generation as, hey, games will look better. But usually, that more powerful technology also brings new ways of playing, new mechanics, because the hardware can support these new experiences. How, how do you feel about this new generation? I mean, for sure, like in terms of um, in terms of Valhalla, we were already able to push things um, in in new ways that wasn't possible before. Um, one of the ways we did that with the Animus Anomalies was to integrate uh, the modern day experience uh, into the fabric of the open world. Um, I think in previous games you had a very separate experience where you would uh, jump out of the simulation. Um, and in this game, you're actually able to seamlessly transition into the modern day while it, it's still in the main world, um, which is just an example of things that we are able to do now that weren't able to do five years ago. Um, and I can imagine like with, with, the, with the new generation of consoles, that's only going to increase uh, the possibilities of what we're able to do. Um, I w I'd like to give our audience a sneak peek into your daily life, into what you do at Ubisoft Barcelona, because it's a common trope that there's no AAA development in Spanish, in Spain, sorry. Like, it's a, big, a <laughs> bit of a backwater from the industry, but Ubisoft Barcelona is not exactly a small studio, right? How many of you are there? Uh, we're around 150, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> that number changes quite a lot. Um, but yeah, around 150 people. Definitely not an indie studio. <laughs> no, that's for sure. <laughs> and what exactly is your role uh, as a studio in the big picture? Uh, you say that work is being sort of um, coordinated from Montreal, right? Like they take the lead mm -hmm. of it. So you are... Yeah taking part taking um, charge of the gameplay of uh, many different things is I, I I'm not sure I understand how this this distributed model Ubisoft uh, uses uh, how yeah I mean work I mean to make a, a large game like uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla took uh, 15 studios across the world um, and the only way for all those teams to come together is really to work uh, in collaboration as one team uh, this might be hard to, to believe, but it, it really is like a, a real, a, an extended family. Um, and from my personal uh, role in this is to really to ensure that the creative direction that we're receiving uh, from the main uh, studio is um, uh, communicated correctly to, to our studio. Um, and in a way, when we're given a mandate to work on, on some of the cool things that you saw earlier, um, we really are allowed the freedom 
to do our work the best way we can. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really the only way that it can work uh, if we're allowed uh, to also bring um, what we think is, is, uh, makes a good experience from our side. Gameplay-wise, what's your favorite part of Valhalla? Oh, uh, <laughs> my favorite part uh, for sure is the exploration and not feeling like you're, um, you have a checklist of things that you have to do. Uh, so it's very organic the way you, you move through the world and you uh, get to live uh, the different stories. Um, that's, that's for sure my, my favorite part and, and how all of that comes together uh through the different endings uh it's uh, for, in my opinion is it's quite impactful and is this something that you think that the average gamer will probably um oversee not notice but you are somehow prado proud of like this kind of tiny thing that you put as a work of love even though you know that probably most people won't notice yeah i mean no, for sure there's always things that no one will ever notice and that's fine <laughs> that's part of the job that's part of the job as long as the overall picture um people um really enjoy the experience and from what i've been seeing online it's it's uh it's been quite quite fun to to see how people react um we've had um I saw the other day a streamer uh, trying to beat one of our zealot knights, and it took him three hours uh, <laughs> to try and, and beat the guy. Um, so, like for sure, like there are things you think people won't notice, and then there are things that people will really spend their time with, which is which is cool to see. And something you wish you could have done or put in the game, but you couldn't in the end. Whew, um, I don't really think there's anything, uh, <laughs> to be honest. We, we were able to do much more than we originally anticipated on this game. Um, I mean, you see the compilation of all the content that we did. Uh, there's so much there and actually quite a few things that we weren't able to, to put in, in that video. Um, but yeah, we're really proud of everything we've, we've managed to do and pull off. Um, for such a new team as well in Ubisoft Barcelona. Uh, it's pretty, pretty awesome to see what, what we pulled off. I'd like to take a step back from the game for a minute uh, because everyone I ask in this industry has a, a interesting story of how they ended working in games. So it looks like it always happens by accident. Uh, you're not Spanish, but you're working <laughs> in Spain. So I guess yeah. there must be some kind of story there. Like, how do you end up working in games? How do you end up in Spain? So what, what's your origin <laughs> story as a superhero? Well, <laughs> well how long do you have? <laughs> um, we, we, we have some time. <laughs> it's, it's a long story. Um, no, but I mean, for sure it started um, in Madeira Island, uh, in the very rural uh, side of Madeira Island. Um, when I was around 14, I wanted to tell stories and I came across um, um, a modding tool for uh, Quake. And I started doing my own levels and trying to tell my own stories. And that's kind of what really started it. And uh, I think two years later, I was forming a company with my brother. Uh, and that really started my, my journey in the industry. And it, it never stopped. Um, and it kind of went into um, uh, the action adventure genre, which I really fell in love with. Um, I got to work on Enslaved and, and Devil May Cry, which were really awesome games in, in that genre and that's really what took me in the end to work on one of the one of the biggest franchises in in, in that genre um in assassin's creed and and here in in barcelona which is an awesome place to work with <laughs> from madeira to barcelona is definitely a, yeah. a good trip um, yes the assassin's creed formula <clears throat> even if it's been changing and evolving over the years is uh, quite recognizable uh, you can you feel you can feel what you're playing uh, as soon as you have a taste of it and it somehow also change and evolve uh, with every new historic set setting uh, it goes to do you think it would support 
any historic setting. It could go even to sci-fi without asking your future plans. But this formula, how flexible can be? Um, I think... I think uh, Jade Raymond uh, explained to you quite well. I saw one of her interviews with you. Uh, she explained that super well. You know, the foundations of the of the franchise is really to allow any kind of setting, any everything is permitted. <laughs> in the end, uh, to to grab the tagline from the original game, um, and is really that really allows us to to come up with new games that still feel fresh and that we want to work on rather than you know doing the same thing um in the original setting from the original game um no for sure that like the modern day construct and the animus uh, allows us to go anywhere which is which is just always so exciting when we talk about the next thing that we get to do how who could be a fly on the wall in this uh, creative meeting? Because it might be like, okay, what are we doing next? <laughs> now, moving forward in time, uh, again, without going into uh, detail about your future plans, because I know you can't talk about it, about that. How do you think the changes brought by the pandemic will stay in your daily life? Some stuff are, is probably here to stay forever. Uh, in remote work and so forth. Uh, what kind of practices are you implementing for the future? I really don't know. I think we're still like trying to feel to feel the new culture that's forming and kind of reacting as we go along. Um, and we're trying to figure out uh, what works best really for the future. Um, I think everyone is still kind of waiting to see what next year is going to be like. Uh, you know, with the vaccines coming, hopefully we'll be able to go back to the office and see our colleagues, which we haven't seen since March. Um, so, yeah, we will see. We'll have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. And my final question before um, we say goodbye. Are you a male Avor player or female Avor player? <laughs> um, I am let the animus decide player <laughs> because if you want if you really want to play to the lore and that is the option that's the most accurate so you will actually be a uh, female uh, Eivor for a chunk of the story and then you'll switch to male in some parts of the story and you'll have an explanation as to why so I would I would definitely recommend you you go with that Okay. Well, Rogelio Silva, Game Design Director at Ubisoft Barcelona, uh, thank you very much for being here, for opening your home to us, to the Financiers Game Festival. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I hope we can see you next year in Bilbao or the year after that or whatever, but uh, that we can make it meet and celebrate what we couldn't this year. It's been a difficult year uh, for everyone. I, I really would love that. Would love to visit Bilbao for sure. Thank you very much again and see you soon.